Христос Анести, в деку, в Христос Анести, Патер. 8 января 2023 года. On January the 8th, 2023, the enthronement of his beatitude Georgius, primate of the Church of Cyprus, took place. Many hierarchs came to this enthronement, including the primate of the Greek Church, Archbishop Hieronymus. A representative of the OCU, former Metropolitan of the UOC, Simeon Shostovsky also arrived. You did not go to the enthronement, Vladika, and said that you would fervently pray for Archbishop Georgius at home. Why did you do that? I think my statement on this matter explains everything. I felt that at the moment of the enthronement of our Archbishop Georgios, for whom I voted in the elections to the ancient throne of the Holy Apostle Barnabas, I, as a Cypriot bishop, should dedicate this day to prayer. Since we are experiencing fateful days in world events and the entire Orthodox Church, it would be more beneficial for our Church and for the Church of the whole world, wherever it is, to dedicate this day to prayer. Prayer for our Archbishop Georgios is especially important since he became the primate at a time of great problems for Orthodox unity and witness, when the new world order no longer hides that its goal is to fight against Christianity, to de-Christianize. This new world order seeks to stone those who are the true voice of Orthodoxy, Orthodox witnesses, Metropolitan Onufri of Kiev is such a voice, backed by the bishops of Ukraine, monasteries and the believing people. That is, the majority of Orthodox people follow Metropolitan Onufri of Kiev, and it didn't happen yesterday or the day before. I stayed at home to pray precisely because I really believe in its power. And the Archbishop of Cyprus needed our prayers, notably on the day of his enthronement. This is first. Secondly, Metropolitan Onufri and his church have a great need for prayer, as it is going through great trials. Thirdly, I am a refugee metropolitan myself. Half of my metropolis is owned by the Turks. In order to go and serve in the occupied territory, at least from time to time, one has to overcome enormous bureaucratic impediments. Sometimes the Turks say yes to us, and sometimes they refuse. They say no. We are going to serve where churches stand without icons, without doors, without windows, like stables. The church of the village where I was born, of Archangel Michael, was a mosque until recently. Why am I saying this? Because I am a bishop with a lot of pain inside. I know what injustice means, both political and ecclesiastical. They go mano a mano. So I am a refugee metropolitan, unfairly offended by history, the interests of the powerful of this world, and especially the Western ones, the British and Americans, and the Turks, 
where half of my homeland is occupied, destitute. But this is a small native land. Ukraine is a big land, while Cyprus is a small island in the eastern Mediterranean. This is an area where everything has been boiling like a volcano for centuries. So it would be a pity if a refugee bishop like me could not understand your pain, the injustice you are living through. To some extent, inthronization often resembles a theatrical action. That is why, in the first line, I wanted to dedicate this time to prayer. And secondly, to express my protest against the injustice that Metropolitan Onufri, as well as the bishops, clerics, monastics and the people under his leadership are exposed to. I want to make it clear that we care about what happens in another part of the body of Christ. All Orthodox, wherever we might be, are cells of the one body of Christ. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. As the Apostle Paul said, it is important that there be continual compassion and condolence. This position of mine was a continuation of my previous statements. Before that, I would tell Archbishop Chrysostomus of Cyprus that I did not agree with the way he was trying to solve the big Ukrainian issue, which has existed for decades. I love and respect the ecumenical patriarch very much. I recognize his contribution to the cause of orthodoxy, but I must say, Plato is my friend, but the truth is more precious. At this historical moment, Metropolitan Anufri of Kiev bespeaks the truth. This means that the Metropolitan of Morpho should be on the side of the truth, because the truth is Christ. Former Metropolitan of the UOC, Simeon Shostatsky, who came to the enthronement, now represents the OCU. He received his canonical ordination in the Russian Orthodox Church. He is banned, but not defrocked. There are many believers, priests and some metropolitans of the Cypriot Church who refuse to recognize the OCU. Are the metropolitans are wary of concelebration with schismatics. Was the choice of Simeon as a participant in the enthronement dictated by something else? One of the bishops who consistently and persistently shares my position, but at the same time has his own, is Metropolitan Nicephorus of Kikos. He also wrote a book about the Ukrainian church issue. I talked with him, asked questions, and realized that he was true to his position he described in his book. However, other bishops of the Cypriot Church have already concelebrated with Epiphanius hierarchs on the Fena and elsewhere. It depends on a particular bishop. 
Perhaps some agree with the position of the Archbishop of Cyprus because of respect for the ecumenical patriarchate, but in no way want to concelebrate with Epiphanius bishops. They consider them either not ordained or schismatics, because the so-called hierarchy of Epiphanius is an artificially created structure, which, instead of bringing a solution to the Ukrainian church issue for the Ukrainian people and for all of us, only made this problem extremely complicated. This means that this is a schism of pan-Orthodox magnitude. It hides underground, but sprouts from Ukraine to Africa, from Ukraine to America, and from Ukraine to Japan. You understand that this is a spiritual problem of world significance, which can be solved only by the Ecumenical Council and the war that preceded this Council, which is already underway and will only get worse with time. It is precisely the war that will give a way out of the current impasse. First, there is a war followed by famine, epidemics and so on. And then those who survive will convene the Ecumenical Council. What is now known to the Cypriot people? The part of Cypriots that lives the church life has correct information about the situation in Ukraine, from their bishops, priests, from the media. Sometimes they can also receive disinformation from the mass media, unfortunately. The people understand that there is great lawlessness and injustice in Ukraine. There are also other 40 countries from the side of the Western Bloc behind this ongoing war between Ukraine and Russia. China, Persia, India and, as we see, Syria and other countries stand behind Russia. So, we have a small stadium called Ukraine, and there is a world war in this stadium. This is the true state of affairs, and the majority of Cypriots understands this. But what can the people say with their family and economic problems? A nation for whom the biggest problem is Turkey, whose position creates problems for both Russia and America. But it will pay for its position. The Lord has his own plans. Not only Russians and Americans have a plan. Here is my answer to your question. This means that the Ukrainian problem is only part of the intricate plan of the new world order. Therefore, Ukrainians should not view the situation only as a separate problem of their own. The UOC, headed by his beatitude Onufri, is going through very difficult times now. One gets the impression that not all hierarchs and primates of the churches are aware of this. All they know but are silent. For example, Patriarch Porfiry of Serbia and Patriarch Ilya of Georgia spoke out in support of the UOC. Other primates do not support Metropolitan Onufri directly. In addition, 
Among the hierarchs of other local churches, very few support the Ukrainian Orthodox Church in words or messages. What is it connected with? Why don't they express their position on what is happening with the Ukrainian Orthodox Church? It would be a mistake on my part to answer this question. Why? Because I will be responsible not for myself, but for others. I don't know why a particular primate or hierarch is silent. Only he himself can say this. The question is, why are they silent? And are they silent only about the problem you are talking about? We see so many other hushed problems. For example, they are silent when homosexuality is now legalized in almost all countries of the world, mainly Western. When the basis of childbearing is being destroyed, male and female, what God created us to be. We are now teaching children that there are many genders. When the European community invites people to eat unclean animals, insects, worms, all this is happening officially. People's nourishment is changing, people's faith is changing, anthropology is changing. Attempts are being made to change the genetic code of each person with a variety of vaccines and artificially created epidemics. And we see that right now there is a great chance for bishops and patriarchs to declare their position on all these issues and topics. However, we hear only deathly silence. And if the bishops speak up, it is very indistinct, as if they are afraid to tell the whole truth. I am talking about what's going on, but why each of them does this, only God and their own souls know. The prophets of the Old Testament, when they saw something among the people, kings and leaders, that did not meet the law of God, they objected, called the people to repentance, called the kings to repentance. Remember what the prophet Nathan did to King David. When David sinned, the prophet did not stop talking. He raised his voice and rebuked him. The prophets were stoned and killed for their words. Yesterday, according to the new calendar, we had the feast of the prophet Jeremiah. Do you see what they did to him? He was stoned by his own people, the Jews, because he didn't want to go with them. We also have the greatest of the prophets, John the Baptist. He spoke to the people about repentance, about the coming of the Messiah. But the Jews did not want such a Messiah as God had given them. They needed a liberator from the Romans, a political liberator not a spiritual one that would deliver them from death, sin and the devil. They wanted a messiah who could fit them. Why was John the Baptist arrested? Because he told the king about the latter's immorality, that his wife was the wife of his brother, that he violated the law of God. There are mass church seizures in Ukraine now. 
There are cases when they were simply destroyed. For example, in Lviv, a temple was dismantled by an excavator. There are several cases of arson of temples a week before and after Easter. In five or six cases, temples were burned or desecrated in some other way. Could you comment on it from the spiritual angle? Thank you for this question. No one has asked me this question so far. Regarding the physical destruction of churches in Ukraine, the devil is troubled by the divine liturgy, fasting and prayer. But most of all, of course, by the divine liturgy and precisely the orthodox liturgy, because only it has the Holy Spirit in itself. There is no Holy Spirit at the liturgies of other denominations. Certainly, you understand that other forces are hiding behind the landscape. And behind these other forces is the devil who dictates his will to them. Just as some saint hears the voice of Christ, the Holy Spirit feels grace within himself, in his heart, in the same way any magician or satanist hears the voice of the devil within himself, the voice of temptation. This voice is his master. He himself allowed the devil to act within him. We saw a great tragedy everywhere, not only in Ukraine, but in northern occupied Cyprus, when we first went there in 2003-2004, when the barricades on the roads were set up. Stalls and mosques were made from churches. Churches were destroyed. This is the main spiritual reason. The Divine Liturgy hinders the devil. Therefore, when I saw this in 2003, I said to myself, I must do everything so that the liturgy begins to be celebrated in these destroyed churches, even despite all the terrible reality of the occupation. So we began to gradually gather our people. Few at first, but then more and more. My main goal was to return the grace of the Triune God and the Holy Spirit to the occupied part of Cyprus. Because where the Orthodox Divine Liturgy is celebrated, there is also freedom from death, sin and demons. There is another reason why temples in Ukraine are being destroyed, a socio-political one. Enemies know that Orthodox people, families, communities unite around the Church, and they say, so I destroyed the temple, killed the priest, intimidated the bishop, and people will simply leave. When they don't have a church, they don't have the opportunity to celebrate the Divine Liturgy. They will move to other places that are safer. That is their plan. They do not want the presence of Orthodoxy in all of Western Ukraine. They do not want the Orthodox to live there. They want only Uniates to remain. And you will see that there will be a structure that has never existed before. They want to use Ukraine for an experiment. 
They want to make the whole of Western Ukraine unit. And then our brothers from the Holy Mount, the bishops who will now serve with the OCU, will be surprised. They will see Epiphanius serve with the units. And then they will have to think carefully. Has one ever seen Onufri concelebrate with the units? Maybe Onufri participated with them in some common event, but never in the Divine Liturgy. He never shared the Holy Communion with them. Such a thing is impossible to imagine. On May the 27th, 2022, the local council of the UOC was held in Fairfania, at which a number of decisions were made. One of them is a return to the ancient practice of commemorating the Patriarch. Now, the priest commemorates only the ruling bishop and his beatitude Onufri, while his beatitude commemorates the patriarch along with other primates of the churches. The second decision concerns the preparation of the chrism. Finally, the third resolution is the opening of parishes abroad. Please comment on the decisions of Fairfania Council and speak about your attitude to them. The second decision about myrrh boiling is the right of each local church to receive myrrh from some Orthodox church. Only it should be Orthodox. The Church of Cyprus once brought the Holy Chrism from Constantinople. Then, for some period, it took it from Antioch, sometimes from Jerusalem. If someday the Cypriot Church makes such a decision, it will be able to boil myrrh itself. As, for example, it itself celebrates the Divine Liturgy. It's canonical. However, there are reasons for special reverence and respect when you take the chrism from some historical center, such as from Constantinople or Jerusalem, the mother churches. The decision regarding the chrism is the right one, and in my opinion, even somewhat belated. Onufri and his synod could have made such a decision earlier, and they had to make this decision even before the start of the war. My answer regarding the chrism is the answer to your other two questions about canonicity. And now I will ask you. Why did Metropolitan Onufri, worthy of all respect, and your synod not take the trouble to ask the Russian Church for autocephaly? Why? We, many Orthodox bishops, ask ourselves this question. Maybe by making such a decision in advance, it would be possible to avoid a lot of problems. And why didn't the Moscow Patriarch Kirill foresee this? When it was obvious that various fascists, Khazars and Satanists in Ukraine had been preparing their followers against Russia for many years, telling them, you are Ukrainians, you are not Russians. It's like saying to the Cypriots, you are not Greeks. We, Cypriots, are Greeks at the same time. And you, Ukrainians, you are Russians too. Isn't it true? You must realize this. We have been reading Slavic history for many years, and we know what Little Russia and Great Russia mean. 
Can it be that small Cyprus has had an autocephalous church for 1,600 years, while the big Ukraine, with millions of believers, is not worthy of autocephaly? Do you understand this? Consequently, your Orthodox Church is also responsible here. For me, there is only one Kiev Orthodox Church, the Church of Onufri. When I say the word church, I mean this very church. And of course, the Moscow Patriarchate is also to blame, because every spiritual leader must foresee the situation. This is how you need to manage, as St. John Chrysostom said. Unfortunately, you did not foresee, did not take any steps in advance. And that's how we came to the current tragic events. Now, about the commemoration of the Patriarch. In Cyprus, we have been commemorating this way for centuries. In my metropolis, the priests commemorate only me. I am their archbishop. Although I am only a metropolitan, but I am an archbishop for the metropolis of Morpho. Each eparchy is a full-fledged church, isn't it? When I serve, I commemorate Georgios, the archbishop of Cyprus. And when Giorgio serves, he commemorates all the primates of the local churches. This is the canons and order, right? There were problems that your synod should have solved decades ago. Foreign parishes are generally a sad phenomenon. For example, if we take Australia, where there are many Christians, each national Orthodox Church has its own hierarchy there. The future Ecumenical Council must resolve this problem. For example, if Russians or Ukrainians come to Cyprus, what, will they organize their Russian or Ukrainian Church here? No. They must submit to the Orthodox Church of Cyprus. What will happen if Russians come here and want to make their Russian church here? Americans, American, Serbs, Serbian, Bulgarians, Bulgarian. You cannot do it like that. It is forbidden. At the moment, the authorities are taking away the key of Pechersk Lavra from the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. One monk, commenting on what was happening, said that no one would be able to take the Lavra without the will of God. What should believers do today to retain their shrines? What should be done in a spiritual plane? To do what the Christians of Constantinople and in other places of Byzantium did during the years of iconoclasm. Read what the Orthodox Greeks did then. Then, you Slavs were not even Christians. Have you ever thought that in order for you, Ukrainians, and us, Greeks, to pray today in fright of icons, Orthodox Greeks shed their blood in the 8th century. Some bishops, Tarasius, whose name you bear, Saint Methodius, Saint Nicephorus, and many other bishops, Michael of Synoda, were imprisoned. They spent years there, in the cellars, along with the rats, and all for the sake of the holy icons. An icon is like a window. When you make the sign of the cross and bow before it, 
this window opens and you see the truth of the heavenly liturgy, eternal life. Because our life is not only what we see around us, there are also angels, there is also our Christ, who celebrates the liturgy in eternal life with the saints. Do you see the great significance of an Orthodox icon? It is alive, and the relics are alive. You know, when I was a deacon, I visited the Kiev Caves Lavra. I served there together with Saint Eumenius the New. He was my confessor. We served there. And I want to tell you something else. The day we arrived in Kiev was the day of the enthronement of Metropolitan Vladimir of Kiev. We went as pilgrims together with Saint Eumenius. As soon as the monks of the Kiev Caves Lavra saw us, they said, this is a good sign, because it was the Greeks who built the Kiev Lavra. And then the Kiev Church went through trials with the Patriarch Philaret. That day was the day when the Moscow Patriarchate sent Metropolitan Vladimir. With great joy, they gave us an old church above the caves, and there we served the liturgy together with Saint Eumenius. Father, don't lose the presence of spirit, don't lose hope. Orthodoxy goes through trials from time to time. And so that we now have our faith, Orthodoxy went through persecution, through the Diocletians, the Roman emperors, through the Jews, through the heretic emperors. However, some were righteous. Ecumenical councils were held, seven ecumenical councils, two more not recognized as ecumenical, which took place under the great Photius and Gregory Palamas. For us, to have this great faith, this monasticism, this divine liturgy, do not lose joy and hope, do not lose courage. What is to be, will be. All this was to happen so that Ukraine would give birth to new saints. Amen. Amen.